All right. So I think it's uh, three o'clock. So let me get started with the introduction. So I would like to welcome everybody to the TCBG seminar this week. Uh, Professor Ken Dill from <clears throat> Stony Brook University is our guest and seminar speaker today. We are very excited about his seminar. Before I introduce uh, Ken, I would like to just uh, repeat a few uh, etiquette uh, items about our webinar. So we are promoting everybody who is attending to panelists, which means you can keep your camera on and you can turn on your microphone. And we would like you to interact with the speaker when, when it comes to the Q&A period toward the end of the seminar. Uh, but uh, in the beginning of the seminar, when we start, uh, I would like to ask everybody to turn off their microphones so there is no noise and voice interruption with the speaker. You can keep their cameras on. I actually encourage everybody to keep their cameras on to have a more interactive session so that the speaker maybe sees some of the people who are listening to his seminar. So if you have a question, please type it in the chat box with your name attached. So that way I can decide whether we should interrupt the speaker in the beginning or we should wait until the end. At the time of queue questions and answers, I'm gonna invite uh, people who have questions to turn on their cameras and microphone and ask their questions themselves so we can have more interaction during the seminar. Okay, so with that, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ken Dill, from, who is actually a named professor of physics and chemistry at the Stony Brook's Univer Brook University. He's also the director for uh, the Center for Physical and Quantitative Biology since 2010 when he moved there. Ken received his bachelor's and master's degree from MIT in mechanical engineering. Uh, and then he did a PhD in biology at University of California, San Diego. <clears throat> After a postdoc at Stanford University, he joined the faculty at UCSF with a little interruption when he was in Florida. But at UCSF, he went through the ranks very quickly and, and became a full professor before actually he moved to um, University, Stony Brook University that he started actually the, the Center for Physical and Quantitative Biology there. So he has a long list of recognition. He has been really a major figure in biophysics in general. Uh, he has served on so many committees, editorial boards. I won't have time to go over all of them, but uh, let me just mention that he has been a, a past president of the Biophysical Society recipient of a major awards from Protein Society, American Physical Society, and also Biophysics. And of course, he's a member of US National Academy of Science and a member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His research is uh, <clears throat> focusing on statistical mechanics and statistical physics and their application to very important biological problems. For example, protein folding is one area that we know him very well for, but he has done really fundamental work and contributions to, to many other areas, including non equilibrium statistical uh, physics <coughs> uh, and how it should be applied again to, to, uh, to biological system. I won't uh, take more time of his seminar, so we, will, we <coughs> look forward to your seminar again. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and for being with us, please. Thank you, Imad, for that very kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation to come here and, and thank you all for coming. Um, before I start, let me just say, um, let me dedicate this to Klaus Schulten. He was an old friend. Um, he used to be there at your place. Uh, Imad worked with him for many years. Uh, Klaus was, as you may probably know, um, was a real master pioneer in molecular simulations, but also he was kind of a closet theory guy. And that's what I'm gonna tell you today. It's some stuff that Klaus and I used to go into the back of seminar rooms and chat about because we both loved thinking about theory um, from a physical point of view and not just simulations. Um, and so this is for Klaus. All right, let me get started. Um, can you all see a single slide there? 
Yes. Okay, great. Terrific, terrific. Here's what I want to tell you about. This is work we've been doing for the last decade since we've been at Stony Brook. Uh, it's the, the question we ask is, how do cells adapt? And by adapt, what I mean is homeostasis, an individual cell, cell you poke it, and then you, and then you let go, and then the cell comes back. It has a restoring force. Or a cell population undergoes evolution, same thing. You change the environment, cells make a change, and then you change it back again, they come back. What's the restoring force? What's the, and is there physics behind all this? How to think about forces in biology. So let me start here. Cells action depends on two things. Um, there's this uh, sort of famous expression, genotype to phenotype, that's number one up here, G to P. And the idea is if you knew the genome of an organism, could you predict its behaviors? And that's part of it, but it's not the whole story. And so what I wanna focus on actually is the rest of the story. Number two is environment matters. In fact, we know that from all the way back to Darwin. Darwin's survival of the fittest principle was the idea that what cells do is they match their environments. And, though, and so very clearly um, cells care a lot about the environment. Let's see, I'm gonna try my, okay, that doesn't work. Uh, Never mind. I was going to try a pointer here, but um, it, it doesn't work. Uh, so if you take a look at these three figures, what you see are traditional growth laws. These are the things that experimentalists uh, have been measuring for years. This is microbial physiology 101. The growth rates of cells depend on the salt concentration in the surrounding solution. They depend on how much food you give a cell and the middle from uh, Jacques Minot, 1949, shows you this. You feed a cell more food and it duplicates faster. Um, kind of, that's sort of the basic thing that everybody knows, but it does reach a speed limit, it plateaus. And also there's a temperature growth rate, a very strong one. And that says, if you put uh, cells in the cold, they grow slowly. If you make them too hot, they die. And this, so this growth curve reflects that. But the basic idea is that environment is at least as important as genotype. And so we call it GE to P, uh, that is genotype and environment to phenotype. Because you take the very same cells, put them in a single beaker, you change the temperature and you see the growth rate change. So the phenotype, the behavior, how the cells act, depend on the environment even when they have the same genotype. Now, I wanna make the case that some adaptations are physics. And that cell fitness is not just about the biology of the gene. If you look at the middle line, that's about if you change the genotype, you change a, an amino acid sequence of a protein, you can change the protein's action, how well it binds, how fast it does, uh, it binds some other protein, how strongly it binds a ligand, that sort of thing. Um, often that comes about by changing the protein structure. So let's call that the protein action, change a gene, you change a protein's action. Look at the top line. Um, you can also change the level, the concentration, the expression level of that protein. So even for a fixed action, you can increase its mRNA levels and you can make more of that protein or less of it. And that also affects the fitness. That's those two lines. Those, are having, those have to do with the genotype to phenotype mapping. The bottom line, however, also has to do with environment. And this is the protein physics. And for protein physics, I mean things like proteins fold and unfold. Proteins, uh, if they don't fold, they're not healthy enough to be able to take protein actions. They can aggregate, and there's all kinds of other energies and forces and molecular motors and, and so forth. And I'll talk a little about some of them. Main point here is that it's not just the biology of the gene that's contributing to the cell fitness. It's also the protein's uh, physics. So here's the, here are the five little vignettes I'm going to give you. We've been trying to make biophysical theoretical models for them. Um, I'm doing multiple ones rather than focusing on a single one because at the very end, I wanna get to a bigger point about how this all fits together in terms of what, is, what are cells trying to do and what's, what's driving them. And I wanna take these individual vignettes to show you uh, pieces of that story. 
So these are physical, these are adaptations, uh, homeostasis and evolution in either a cell when you poke it or a cell's population when you evolve it. These are physical chemical ad adaptations. First is, <clears throat> is food, what I, uh, one of the growth curves I just showed you. How does it control growth speed? The Warburg effect is a funky little thing I'll tell you about uh, having to do with fermentation. And the question is, why does it do this, this weird thing that's sort of seemingly nuts? Um, motors, how, what's optimized here in molecular motors like FOF1 ATPase, for example? Speed, power, work, efficiency, what exactly do cells care about? Um, and uh, stress response, um, which is primarily in the folding of the proteome, not entirely, but primarily. And the question is, how does the cell keep its proteome appropriately folded? Uh, it has all, the proteome is the collection of all proteins in the cell. And um, so this, it has to sort of manage this like herding cats. Finally, aging, how does uh, proteostasis collapse when protein folding is no longer maintained in the cell is known to be a key part of aging. And so we make models of these various things. First, let me focus on forces. How do we express these tendencies in terms of forces? So focus first on the left picture. This is standard physical chemistry. Um, most of you, I'm sure, know this story probably backwards and forwards. The basic idea is um, forces alternatively can be expressed in terms of things like energy or free energy landscapes and in terms of something like a variational principle. So the picture on the left is showing you the standard thing in materials equilibrium thermodynamics. It's the second law. And it says the second law tells you how to find equilibrium. And it either is that the entropy gets maximized or the case we most, most of us care about is the free energy gets minimized. And so if X on that figure is showing you some conformational degree of freedom or some position or coordinates or velocity or something, then, um, and if you have the, uh, and if that's a degree of X, X is a degree of freedom, then the free energy as a function of that, what happens is it's like a ball rolling downhill. So it's like a mechanical energy kind of thing. It's spontaneous, balls roll downhill spontaneously. This is the world of PCAM, it's the world of binding and folding and uh, membrane formation, partitioning, solvation, assembly, stuff like that. It's dead, but, it, but they're all downhill. I call it pull driven because it's driven, if you will, by, in looking at that picture by the, to get to the bottom of the hill, that's where the ball wants to go. And there's no external driver in this case. So that's sort of standard PCAM near equilibrium rates and principles of forces. The picture on the right though is where we wanna be for today's talk. And so I wanna take a minute to tell you a little more about this. This is not about equilibrium. It's not about things that are tending towards equilibrium. Bio biology is not tending towards equilibrium. Um, it hasn't tended towards equilibrium for three and a half billion years. Uh, and so it, the, but you still can write landscapes and you can still look at potential kinds of functions and you can still express forces. And they look something like the picture on the right. So if I have too much protein, say, let's say I'm talking about expressing some particular protein in a cell. If I have too much, it's like having the ball roll uphill and the ball wants to roll back hill, back downhill again to produce less protein. Or if I have too little, the ball wants to roll where it is down to, towards the right to produce more. That's, the, that's the, what's sustaining the cell is this persistent balance of flows. You want the flow to be sort of Goldilocks-like, not too little and not too much. And so this is what homeostasis is about. Um, so a, a cell has the freedom to be able to change its protein expression levels within its existing biochemical networks, or a population can evolve. So it can uh, lead to, an, uh, on average, a higher level of protein expression or lower level. I call this push driven and I'll show you why in, in just a minute, but these are non-equilibrium forces as opposed to the picture on the left, which are near equilibrium forces. And they're driven by, by some input stream. In this case, it would be by production of protein. It's got an external driver. So let me illustrate that a little more, <clears throat> a little more clearly. 
In the left are some of these non-equilibrium kinds of forces that require drivers that are not necessarily near equilibrium, where the second law is not the governing principle at all. And an example is you plug in a motor and it runs, or you hook it up to a battery and it runs. Uh, bottom left is an electromagnet. It's not a magnet unless the current is turned on. It won't pick up nails unless you turn on electrical current. You turn the electrical current off and it won't pick up nails anymore. So the magnetism depends on having an input flow of something. Uh, hurricanes are like this too. A hurricane, um, in my crappy little drawing here, a hurricane is sh showing you an ocean and three little red arrows are showing you that when oceans are warm, what happens is heat uh, flows upwards, heat rises, and that's the engine. It's, a therm it's, a, it's like a Carnot engine. Um, it drives the spinning of the hurricane. But if you have a cold ocean, uh, those little red arrows aren't there anymore and no hurricane. So you need an input force to be able to get these non-equilibrium kinds of forces. Now in cell biology, this is what I'm gonna focus on here, is that you need input, you need input flows also. Uh, the top picture is showing that if you have food going into a cell, it can duplicate. Middle one shows if you have ATP available, you can spin molecular motors like FO, F1, ATPase, for example. And if you have uh, a chaperone that can fold proteins, uh, you need ATP flowing in and you need unfolded protein folding in and then you can fold proteins. All of these require drivers. It's different than the second law. So we're, we're operating under a different principle here. Survival of the fittest is an idea that's based on this kind of non-equilibrium driver. And we're interested in kind of going after what is that all about in these specific instances. So this is to illustrate. So take a look at the thing on the right. This is a leaky bucket. Um, water is trickling out of the bottom of the bucket at some rate. If you wanna keep the level constant X, then you need an inflow rate that is balanced with the outflow rate. And then you will keep that level constant forever. It's sustainable, it's persistent, uh, and, as and it will be balanced as long as the input and the output uh, are the same. Now, on the left, I'm showing you the picture of how do we turn that idea into forces and potential. Top uh, in green shows you, suppose the inflow is just a constant and doesn't depend on the level of water that's in there. I'm just dripping it in from some hose and I'm dripping it in at a constant rate. Now, suppose, however, that the outflow rate is something that depends on what the water level is. So I could imagine the more water level I have, the faster the flow out the bottom hole. That's what the red line is showing you on the left. Now I can write a force as the difference between inflow minus outflow. This, I call it a force, but it's really a difference in rates. It's the rate in minus the rate out. And that difference is you can see crosses, the, crosses zero at a particular point where the dashed line is. And so what that crossing zero means is simply that the inflow rate and the outflow rate are the same. There's no force that's changing the level, if you will. Now integrate that force like you would do in normal simpler physics and, all, and you get a potential and that potential shows you a minimum and it, you can imagine rolling a ball on that potential. It's not quite the same sort of force you're familiar with. It's a difference in rates but it's just as predictive. It's a, it's a variational principle that we need for, for biology. Um, and so this is telling you that where the minimum is, is telling you what is the flow balance that you need to be able to sustain a persistent water level at a fixed value. Okay, let's go through these uh, examples now. First one is um, that growth speed depends on food. The bottom is showing you this uh, food growth law from Minot 49. Um, and again, it's that add more food around the cell, it grows faster, but it's got a speed limit. So the picture at the top is showing you the mechanistic model we're trying to achieve here. We know what food is coming in. Um, when, it com when food is coming, when enough food is coming in, the cell is duplicating faster and faster. And the black box in the middle, the cell, the mechanism we're trying to model is a switch. It's a ribosome switch. We're trying to decide 
uh, how does the cell figure out when it should be duplicating um, versus when it should be sitting here just idling, spinning its wheels, repairing its broken proteins and things of that type. It has the two modes. It's like, it's like just flipping a switch. So we make a model. Okay, so here's the puzzle. The model is driven by a puzzle. The puzzle is why, doesn't, why can't E. coli um, duplicate faster than it does? The fastest, the speed limit for duplication of E. coli is about 20 minutes experimentally, 20, 20 25 thereabouts uh, experimentally. Now, the problem is uh, I can make a really simple, you know, back of the envelope calculation that tells me there's something funky with that number. I think E. coli ought to be able to duplicate as fast as six minutes, but it can only duplicate as fast as 20 minutes. What's the discrepancy in this factor of three? Now, for one thing, first of all, E. coli duplication is already super fast. It's pretty amazing. It's an amazing machine. But so this little factor of three is actually small relative to um, the world of all possible numbers of ribosomes that would can sit inside a cell. But here's what happens. If you give the cell more food, it upregulates its number of ribosomes. So that top blue line there says, uh, shows that growth speed is proportional to the number of ribosomes. Now I make a simple model. I say the fraction of proteins that are ribosomes versus non-ribosomal um, is on the x-axis from zero to one. Well, a ribosome, an individual ribosome can copy itself in six minutes. So if I made E. coli, if E. coli were evolving to be just the fastest little NASCAR speed thing it could possibly be, uh, it could duplicate in six minutes because every ribosome would only have to copy itself and then it would have two daughter cells and that's it. So one copy of itself, how fast can a ribosome make a copy of the 55 proteins inside itself? Six minutes. So why doesn't E. coli run that fast? So that's shown on that little picture, which is showing you the blue dot at the top is showing you the speed limit, the six minute speed limit that we could imagine physically. And the red dot is showing you the reality. What happened, to, where's the factor of, of three coming from? So we make a little model. The model is just glucose comes in the front door on the left at some rate, it produces ATP. We're leaving out all the biochemical details here. We're just simplifying the cell for our purposes to look at this one little black box machine, how it makes decisions about food and duplication. Makes ATP at a certain rate, J sub A, then the ATP either goes up to make ribosomes or goes down to make non-ribosomal proteins. Now there's complicated feedback here because a ribos ribosomes are needed to make more ribosomes Ribosomes are also needed to make the other proteins and proteins are needed to make ribosome. So there's a whole bunch of stuff sort of talking to each other uh, in this, in this uh, system. But we can write down the differential equations for it. It's just three little differential equations. Um, the first one is dr dt, that's um, d ribosomal protein d time. dp dt is d non ribosomal protein d time. And da dt is how much ATP is changing per unit time. Now the J's on the right side of the equation are themselves like Michaelis-Menten forms. Um, they have some binding and stuff in them. And so this, these are three coupled ordinary differential equations that are all nonlinear. At steady state, the left sides of all of them are zero. You can solve, it turns out to be a third order polynomial. Forget about the stuff on the right at the moment. We can solve the model we can actually compute all the properties of this little model and we can ask, okay, how, depending on how much food that I have coming in the front door, um, what, why and how does this thing upshift its ribosomes? Now, we've already said that the fitness function here is not entirely about duplication speed of E. coli because of this factor of three. I'm looking to understand what the fitness function is when E. coli is running pretty fast. So what we postulate, and, and that's kind of how some of these evolution problems have to go, you postulate a fitness function and then see how far it gets you and what experimental data you can predict from it. We postulate that the fitness function is about efficiency. 
when you're running fast. So think about a NASCAR here. Uh, NASCAR may well just be designed for pure speed, but when you're running pretty fast, um, biology may have a different idea. And here's the evidence that uh, fitness could matter. You take a look at some kinds of biology, they look like trees. You look at some other kinds of biology, they look at, at like cows. This is where I'm supposed to make a spherical cow joke, but I'm not gonna stoop to that. Anyway, the thing is, here's the difference. It's all about surface to volume ratio. And the surface to volume ratio is all about efficiency because trees don't have to move. They don't have to worry about friction. They don't have to worry about their weight. They don't have to worry about how heavy they are. They don't move and they get their energy from the sun. So I just wanna be maximum possible surface to volume ratio. So trees look like trees. Minimum possible surface to volume ratio looks like a cow or a human being or a mouse or a fish or a dog. And so we're all sort of much closer to a sphere. And why? Because this is to be efficient, you have to be to be to function um, as an animal, as a mobile, as mobile biology, you have to be able to move. And so you have to think about friction, weight, uh, velocity, stuff like that. So the point of this silly little picture is just to point out that um, it's energy efficiency and not just speed, obviously trees don't go very fast. Um, it's energy efficiency that could matter. We assume that, we plug it into the model, we ask if it works on the y-axis of this picture, I'm showing you efficiency, energy efficiency, which is growth rate per ATP molecule. That's how we're defining efficiency here. Um, on the x-axis is the fraction of ribosomes, the thing that I plotted for you before. And what you see instead of the thing, the curve going up all the way to the, to the FR equals one axis, it curves back down. And this is because it's not very energy efficient if uh, all you have is nothing but ribosomes. It turns out the optimum from this little uh, simple sort of cubic polynomial model is that the optimal ratio of ribosome to total protein is about 0.8. And you see the data there from E. coli and a bunch of uh, relatives of it. And the, there's a little picture that's showing you pairs of tubes uh, above that, which is the explanation for why is this true. And you can, the best way to think about this is that, think about a NASCAR for a minute, uh, a race car. So the race car, you can divide up the, um, the essentials of the energy utilization in terms of a carburetor, which is the front end, which is where the fuel and the air come in and mix together, which is the green, which uh, on the left picture is the green uh, cylinder. And then you have the back end is the motor and that's the red cylinder. And so when you're on the left side of this diagram, small values of the x-axis, it means you have a big carburetor and a small motor. On the right side, you have a small carburetor and a big motor, and in the middle, you have them matched. And essentially what this model is saying is you need them to be matched. That's the optimal function for E. coli running at high speed. Why is that? Well, because if you had a great carburetor and a small motor, you're wasting all your energy building carburetors. And by building, what I mean is you're you're directing your proteins to become uh, glucose transporters and to convert to ATP and so forth. And you're not spending any of your energy on making ribosomes that are essentially like the motor in a NASCAR. So this is Goldilocks. It's, you don't want too big a carburetor for the motor size. You don't want too big a motor for the carburetor size. You want them just matched. And that's what the model tells you. And it's predictive of this uh, result. Now here's a puzzle though. Uh, adaptation is not always about optimizing stuff. Um, this, is a, this is something that has been puzzling for a while. It's called the Warburg effect. It happens in cancer cells. It happens in E. coli that are fast growing. It happens in most kinds of cells that can, can grow really fast. And so on the x-axis here, I'm showing you the growth rate of the cell. And I'm showing these two curves are showing you what E. coli decides to do. And so it shows you when you're at slow growth rates, 
Mostly it does respiration, oxidative phosphorylation. It uses oxygen to make, uh, to convert glucose to ATPs. And that's really smart. The blue curve is really smart because um, respiration is very efficient. It's 30, it makes 30 ATPs per glucose molecule. So this is a really clever evolutionary discovery was figuring out um, how, to, how to do oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, on the other hand, the, the purple one, whatever, pink or something, um, is fermentation. That only makes two ATPs per glucose. That's not anywhere near as efficient. It's a much earlier evolutionary adaptation. And so why is it when you start growing cells at a really fast growth rate, all of a sudden this really inefficient mechanism starts to take over? That would seem to be pretty dumb. And so there have been a number of models out there that um, have tried to argue this on the basis of, well, it's, it's smart from some E. coli point of view, it's an adaptation and E. coli is doing something that we just haven't figured out. But there's a different explanation for it and that's the one we favor. And that is, um, yeah, evolution does try to optimize things, but every once in a while it starts running into constraints and it simply bumps up against something that it just can't do where it can't improve any further. And so let me walk you through our model for what we think is going on in this case. In this case, we take, we, we know a lot of numbers. There's a lot of numbers out there that we can look at for glucose rate uh, in, oxygen rate in, sizes of E. coli, shapes of E. coli. We know all of this stuff. Um, and that's really, and we, we know the sizes of the protein molecules that are involved as well. So that, those are the ingredients that go into this, uh, trying to get an understanding of this thing. So start at the top left, <clears throat> that picture is showing you a straight line. Um, this is, uh, call this the expectation. The expectation is if I need the cell to grow faster and faster, lambda gets bigger, I'm going to the right on the x-axis, I need the cell to grow faster, then I need the glucose rate per unit volume to go up linearly because it's the volume that the glucose is, is having to uh, produce the energy to duplicate. So I need um, the energy per unit volume to go up linearly if I want the speed to go up. But okay, let's follow these four arrows um, because there's two constraints here that are acting on this. First of all, when E. coli grows faster and faster, it does um, a sort of funky thing, which is at slow growth, E. coli are relatively spherical, but when they grow faster, they're kind of elongated rod-like things with an axial ratio that's sort of in the ballpark of four to one or five to one or so. So they change, it changes shapes like those little orange things show you. So what that means is that the surface area to volume ratio decreases according to that, uh, that red line. Okay, so now I convert that, the next line to, down to the left. I convert now from glucose rate per unit volume to glucose in per unit area that I need. And the bottom line is if I need, if I wanna to get to fast growth rate to the right on the lambda curve a line, I need to all of a sudden start cranking glucose in really fast. That curve goes up. But here's the problem, the final, bottom arrow to the right is showing you the problem. If I look at electron transport chains, so this is the oxidative phosph uh, phosphorylation pathway. If I need the electron transport chains per unit area uh, to go up at the rate that blue curve goes up, the problem is I discover it saturates. So that's the second constraint that the system has on it. I can, only, I can only put so many electron transport chains for respiration into the E. coli's membrane. And here's a picture of that. Take a look at the bottom picture on the left. <clears throat> so I should, first, let me say, electron transport uh, complexes are about 40 proteins in three complexes. I write that as ETC, that's the respiration route. Those are the blue objects. If instead I wanna ferment, then um, I just need glucose transporters, a single protein, and it's thin, it's a little stick. And so I have fat things and I have thin things. So here's the thing, the smartest thing for me to do if I'm E. coli is I wanna put as many of the blue, blue things as I can in the membrane. 
Um, and so go from low lambda on the left to the middle to medium lambda, you see I'm starting to fill up the whole membrane now with these electron transport chains for respiration. And I have a parking problem. Now I've got all these cars parked and there's nothing, there's no space left for bringing in any more electron transport chains. And so, but what I can do if I had a parking problem is I can bring in motorcycles. I can stick them in between the cars and I can still sort of get more out of the membrane's ability to transport glucose in. And that's showing you this red line, uh, the black, the black uh, bars are showing you the saturation by ATC. And the red line is showing you what E. coli really needs, it, needs to do if it wants to get up to these faster growth rates. So this is the problem in this case. E. coli would love to put in more ATC complexes if it could because it's efficient. That's what it would want to do, but it gets crowded and then it's got no other option if it still needs to get more uh, oxygen and glucose in than to use uh, glucose transporters, which is the fermentation pathway. So it turns out there's sort of an unexpected prediction and that's what you want in models. <clears throat> and it turns out, I won't go through this figure, I just wanna give you an overview of that. What happens is it's also clever in a side effect kind of way that by switching to fermentation, which is where that blue curve deviates from the red dashed curve, by switching to fermentation, you also avoid toxicity of uh, NADH, NAD plus. That's because those things happen to be involved with the electron transport chain. And so the more oxidative phosphorylation you do, you bring in more of that stuff to be able to haul your electrons around. Um, but the trouble is um, that starts getting toxic for the cell. Okay, let me switch now to motors. Um, what do they optimize, speed, work, or efficiency? They're very efficient. Bio machines can be super efficient. They can reach nearly 100%. Um, many of you will realize that the Carnot limit uh, is not a limit for things like electric motors or things like chemical potential engines like, like these bio machines are. They're only, the Carnot limit only applies to heat engines like internal combustion. So this is why you're all buying Teslas these days because electric motors are not limited to like 20 or 30% max efficiency. In principle, if you get good bearings and all that stuff, you could get up to nearly 100. And what you're seeing is the blue dots are all kinds of different molecular motors. And the ones that are up close to the black line, those are the ones that are running at nearly 100% efficiency. And that's wonderful. That's certainly what we would want. We, we humans take in energy, we want to use it efficiently. But so now what we're trying to do is to figure out, well, what does evolution do to, to get it there in the first place? Um, so bottom picture on the left is showing you a yellow part. What we're doing is we're making a simple model of a molecular motor, and we're making it a little kinetic model is all. This is not a structure-based model, a little kinetic model. Um, I have two steps, an ATP intake step or a gradient um, or, a, or like a proton gradient intake step, and then I have mechanical output step. Now look at those two barriers. In this model, I'm free to just make either of those two barriers anything I want, ultimately to be able to get the measured barrier. So there's, there's two things we know here. How much energy am I getting from the ATP that's going in? How much work am I getting out? Those are observables. Um, in the little panel on the right, I have two other variables that I put into this little toy model. Lambda is a barrier balance and delta is work done, whether work is done in the forward or reverse directions. And I use those two knobs as models of what evolution could do in principle. It can tweak on where those barriers are and how high they are in order to achieve the output that we measure and the input that we use. And so what is it, what, what would you do? How would you tweak those barriers? Well, take a look at the top picture. Um, the top picture is one example. The blue is giving you one example of how I could make a molecular motor. The red is a, an example of how I could, a different way to make a molecular motor. But the panel on the right shows you they have very different behaviors, speed versus efficiency. The blue line, um, which is called a power stroke, is great because it gets high speed at high efficiency. That's exactly what you want your car to do. 
You want Tesla to make you something like that. The red line is terrible. That's called a Brownian ratchet. You don't get much speed if you need more efficiency or you don't get much efficiency if you need speed. So how do you get the magic here? How do I get to a power stroke? Um, and the bottom curve shows you the answer to that. If you look at just this little dashed blue curve, that's showing you that in the process of taking a step uh, through the two steps from A to of intake of energy to B, which is the output work, then back to A again, the next stay, the next cycle of the machine, that I store some energy. I need to store some energy. That's what that blue curve is showing you. Somehow there's energy storage, and that's the clever part of how a power stroke is so successful at capturing everything we want, speed and efficiency. Well, how could you do that? Well, so we made a little toy. We haven't re really done calculations with it. So this is just to illustrate to you um, how you can store energy inside a molecular motor, because that's what you need if you want both speed and efficiency. Uh, let's see, I can't wave my hands and I can't point anything here, I'm afraid. Um, so, uh, but imagine, so the thing is the yellow thing in the center is the rotor. All the gray stuff around the outside is the stator. It's the thing that's just sitting there statically. If that yellow thing can both twist, which it has to do because it's the axle, um, it can turn because it's the axle or, and it can also twist so that it's like a rubber rod, if you will, so it can store energy. Then if you take the top right step, you get ADP coming in, the bottom negative charge is less happy than it was before. Now, a proton great flows through um, based on a gradient that twists the top part. So now the rod is twisted. Um, now, at the same time, ADP gets converted to ATP. That's what this motor does. It makes ADP, it makes ATP from ADP. And that then turns rigidly the twisted, the already twisted rod. And now the top part springs back. Anyway, this is just a little toy to show you that um, if you have a way of storing energy in a process where you take in chemical energy and you get work out, if you can store, then you can get a power stroke. And that's really important because that gives you features you want in biology. And here you see it. This is, these are a bunch of different biological molecular motors. Um, the one on the right um, in the sort of ugly green color is uh, ATPase. That's the FOF1 ATPase I told you mentioned before. You really want that one to be efficient in biology because that's the thing that does most of your converting uh, for all of us uh, from glucose to ATP. You really want that to be as efficient as possible. It's, it uses about half of the energy in your body and it is efficient. And so it's done it by something like a, the sort of toy picture I just showed. Um, don't know, that was just a conceptual picture, so I don't have proof. But then um, you can also see for whatever reasons, RNA polymerase is just at the opposite end. It's a Brownian ratchet. It's not very efficient. Maybe uh, apparently doesn't need to be. And then there's a whole bunch of other motors and they're sort of in between all of these things. So the machine's properties differ depending on what jobs they perform in the cell or in, in different uh, biological settings. This is um, a fitness landscape that shows you that if, if you have an environment at, that you want to design a motor to work in, that you're going to tell me how much input there is, the delta mu zero, that's the energy available. Is it coming in from ATP or is it coming in from some gradient or what have you? You're gonna tell me how much energy you have available for this particular operation. Then uh, that's on one of the axes. And then on the other axis is how much output work do you need to create? And that depends on, you know, are you pushing and pulling on big heavy things or are you doing something else? And it turns out all the red dots, the, so the curves here are showing you the calculations from this simple little two state model I just showed you, where we can, where we can tweak the two evolutionary degrees of freedom. And what we find are that the red dots are real systems and sure enough, they lie at the top of the ridge. And that ridge is all about power. It's speed times efficiency. And so what it says is what biology is doing is it's trying to optimize that product, that uh, it's trying to optimize power. 
for the different input and output conditions. All right, next example <clears throat> um, is chaperones. Uh, we cells have this big problem. They've got thousands of different types of proteins, copy numbers of different proteins. <clears throat> they proteins can be an unfolded state or native state folded, or they can misfold, or they can turn into uh, nuclei for, for aggregation, or they can ag go on into aggregation, uh, <clears throat> into bigger aggregates, <clears throat> excuse me. And so the issue is how does the cell, and, and the other thing I should say is all of the, the differences between these states are only a few kt. So the cell is always just sort of hanging by a thread here, trying to keep its proteins folded. Um, it can't just do it by pure spontaneous actions alone, otherwise everything would go to the left and it would all aggregate. So the solution uh, in the cell is that cells use chaperones. Um, they take in an unfolded protein sequence or a misfolded one in some cases, and they take in ATP <clears throat> and then they fold proteins. And um, a lot is known by, from the experimental biophysics community about how the GROEL chaperone and the DNAKJ chaperones work in E. coli and so on. A lot of molecular detail, it's really beautiful work. Um, I'm not gonna go into much about what we do here because I just wanna use this um, as an example to tell you uh, what goes wrong with the system. And so the picture, this picture is showing you the, the gray uh, panel is showing you the super highway that I just showed a second ago of what the protein will do spontaneously all by itself. And all the other colors, the pink and the blue and the yellow and so forth are showing you, if you will, the traffic patterns of what the chaperones do. There's different ones here. There's DNA, KJ, GROEL, LON protease, clip B. Those are the main ones. <clears throat> we can write down all the traffic and by that, I mean, we write down ordinary differential equations and every arrow has a rate coefficient in it. Um, and we can solve this model. We, there's a lot of data out there that we could use to parameterize the model. Um, what we can learn from this model is that proteins traffic very differentially. The bottom, pan, the bottom plane is showing you proteins that are very sick, meaning they're very stuck, very misfolded. They're, they can't, they're really, they would stay there for a long time without a chaperone. They can't get out of their stuck state. Um, the heavy arrows are showing you that they mostly, those really sick proteins mostly go through the GROEL system. The GROEL system uses lots of ATP. The plane on the top shows you proteins that can pretty much fold on their own, but sometimes just get a teeny bit stuck. Um, it turns out they go through a trigger factor that's the two heavy arrows on the left. They mostly go through trigger factor and trigger factor doesn't cost any energy. The very clever system, I'm not gonna go through it, but there's a lot of interesting conclusions about how perfectly poised the chaperone system in E. coli is. It spends energy for the sickest proteins. It doesn't spend energy on the less sick ones. But the main point I wanna to get to really is to tell you about a failure of adaptation not the adaptation itself, not the, the proteostasis unfolding itself, but rather how it fails. Because all of these um, adaptations, to learn something about adaptations, we also have to learn about uh, what are the constraints, what are the limits, and what are the failures. And so this is what we're interested in is how, how do cells uh, age and die? And this is a, an example of uh, a failure of adaptation. It's an example of when proteostasis collapses. Proteostasis, what I mean by that is the whole system of chaperoning proteins to keep them folded, of um, producing, of synthesizing new proteins, and of degrading bad proteins. That's the, that's the proteostasis system. It's a big part of what the cell does. It's a big part of its energy, but it fails in aging and and cell death. <clears throat> and so here's the evidence that proteost proteostasis collapse is an important part of aging. It's certainly not the only thing, <clears throat> sort of everything goes wrong. Once, once a cell starts to die, everything goes wrong. So we're not asking about, what we wanna do is to get a little more granular though about how proteostasis collapse uh, happens in aging, but also what we think is it's a, 
it's one of the major drivers. And the reason is uh, aging is a major stress on cells. Um, proteostasis is the front line for stresses. Keeping your proteins folded is basically the way you avoid um, is, is the stress response uh, system. Um, all of the genes that are seen in old people, they call them Geronto genes, there are stress related genes. And the main risk factor for 50 different protein diseases like the neurodegenerative diseases is age. That's the main risk factor. Um, proteins are the main repairers. Um, and also aging is not about one gene or one protein or one biochemical pathway. It's gotta be about a more global thing. Here's some evidence about that. One is you'd look at different organisms, you normalize their age on the x-axis from zero to one. And uh, it turns out you look at how oxidate, uh, the oxidative damage of proteins in those organisms and you see it follows a universal curve. It doesn't matter whether you're a person or a rat, uh, it turns out once you get to be more than about 60 or 80% of the average lifespan of your organism, then your oxidative damage starts going up in a very nonlinear way. And the um, pink curves are showing you this disease called progeria, which is where you've seen these sometimes, these people who are like 16 years old and they look like 80 year old people, they have oxidative damage that starts young we model this. So we're interested in asking, well, okay, what's going on here? Why is proteostasis not being sustained anymore? And the way we model it is we, we call the model I just showed you a minute ago, we call it the hospital model of chaperones because it's uh, very much like a hospital. It has to figure out what disease a protein has or how sick a protein is. And then it has to, it has to cure it, if you will, by folding it. Um, so what we do is we add in a term to that model that tells us we have linear oxidative damage with age. So this is stuff that accumulates over your lifetime. As when you get to be 80 or 90 years old, it turns out half of your proteins are oxidatively damaged. They have about, on average, about one oxidative damage event per protein molecule. Um, and some of this damage is irreversible. Breaking backbones, the cell can repair it. Breaking side chains, the cell can't always repair those. So we make some calculations with this model and it turns out it's a pretty simple model but it captures some really interesting experiments. So it's the experiments I wanna focus on. Top left is really kind of stunning to me as, a, as an experiment. Here's the thing. So uh, you have C. elegans is the name of the worm. It's a model system for aging, it's great. Because, you, because worms live a life, have a lifespan of about 20 days. It's, so it's short and you know, and all the, a lot of the um, information about the worms and the worms nervous system and its genes are known very well. So this happens to be a model organism. We can model it. It turns out you mo we model it by taking E. coli and multiplying up basically all the rate constants in that whole traffic pattern by 10 and then that gets you to worms. Now, top left picture. This is really cool, I think, really interesting. Um, mostly worms tend to be grown around 20 degrees or so. So that's right in the middle of that plot on the x-axis. The, the x-axis is showing you the growth temperature. You put worms in a, <clears throat> in a controlled temperature environment. Uh, 20 degrees, what you see is the relative lifespan um, is high. It's up there at about two on the y-axis. So that's 20 days. Now, um, it turns out if, however, you grow worms at about 35 degrees, then it turns out all the worms in the, in the whole population live only about two hours. So going from 20 days to two hours, it's just temperature. So lifespan of worms is super temperature dependent. That's somehow this is just physical chemistry, but this is dictating lifespan. And the model captures this pretty well. And it's really basically that protein folding, the folding of the whole proteome is very temperature sensitive when you get up to higher temperatures. The proteins tend to unfold a lot. And then you're overrunning your chaperones and so on. I won't go through these other figures, but they're showing you different aspects too of if you oxidize and so forth. <clears throat> um, that, this, that aging is very physical in worms.
it's not one gene, it's not one protein. This is really, it's affected by things like temperature and oxidation agents and stuff like that. Uh, we can analyze what it's telling us. What did we learn here? Um, and then I'm nearly finished here. Um, that's a, top is a survival curve. It's just showing you that 100% of the worms are alive till, till day 20, and then everybody starts dropping off under normal circumstances. And the curve and the little panel at the bottom is showing you what's going on in the physics in the model. And what it's showing you is that um, proteins over time are, co are collecting up slowly irreversible damage. We're all getting our proteins oxidized a little bit at a time over your lifespan. Now what's happening is some of that, so some of the damage is irreversible and the irreversibly damaged proteins are distracting the chaperones. The chaperones are thinking, I bet I can fix this. And it turns out it's not fixable. So the chaperone is swallowing up a bad protein and doing everything it can to fold it again and it can't fold it. Meantime, it's just distracting that chaperone from trying to fold good proteins. And ultimately what happens is it gets so, chaperones, the whole chaperone systems get so distracted by going after the irreversibly damaged proteins that they're no longer working on your good proteins anymore to keep them folded. Chaperones start to overflow, proteins start to aggregate. So here's my little picture of this in terms of flow diagrams. I got three of these pictures. First one is, imagine a cell, it was not an active device at all. Imagine a cell was just a little bag of protein and that you start the water level here is showing you the level of good proteins, a little lake of good proteins and they're all folded up nicely and you're, they're inside this little bag, um, an E. coli like bag, except there's, it's not an active cell. It's not taking in energy, it's not doing anything. Well, what'll happen is the good proteins will start to misfold at some rate, uh, a few at a time. And then those misfolded proteins will go on and aggregate at a certain rate. And basically all you get is this lake pours into the ledge, which pours into the valley. And ultimately you just end up with a bunch of aggregated protein. Um, that's not sustainable, that's not a live cell. In live cells, healthy cells, the flows balance. Now what happens is I've got all these green arrows. Not only do I have the arrows I showed a second ago, but I have new protein synthesis. That's coming because I'm taking in food, I'm synthesizing proteins, I'm using ATP, the top left arrow. Second thing is I also have the middle uh, arrow, which is when I have misfolded proteins, they get chaperoned. And again, I'm using ATP for that. So I'm pumping stuff uphill and I'm keeping the lake level uh, where I want it. And also it turns out the bottom, the very bottom part, I have an arrow that goes down that bad proteins are getting degraded. That's an active process also. That's the unfolded protein response. But all of those three arrows that are coming from active processes are keeping my lake at the, at the same level that I want it to be. This is how healthy cells work. Now here's the problem in old cells. This is where Flow balance is lost, proteostasis is lost, adaptation is lost, the thing no longer is, is running by this flow balance. Synthesis is smaller, that arrow at the top left is small. Oxidative damage has, is now accumulating, it's, it's uh, producing misfolded and, and aggregated proteins now from good proteins. And all the other arrows have dwindled down, your energy balance is not keeping that stuff going anymore. All right, um, essentially got two last slides just to summarize now. So um, in terms of the vignettes, the argument is we're looking at microbial physiology and we're just trying to see how much of it we can explain from peak hemp um, as simple physical biophysical processes. So in the food case, the idea is we have a ribo switch uh, that is a switch that sends uh, energy, ATP energy, either to making ribosomes, which then duplicate the cell or send, um, or the ATP goes to making non-ribosomal protein. Um, and that's a switch that maximizes efficiency. That's the fitness function in, in that case. Warburg effect, um, cells switch into fermentation uh, simply because membranes crowd. That's a case of having constraints. It's not trying to do this for some smart reason. Motors, uh, power strokes can give both speed and efficiency. 
and the bio machines are really driven by the the input output needs what do you have um, in terms of a supply of energy and what do you what do you need in terms of work out or speed out or what have you proteostasis is uh, this is a non-equilibrium process atp comes in drives chaperone folding and aging is a collapse of all that stuff oops sorry Finally, last slide, principles of adaptation. What are we learning from all these various things, kind of trying to synthesize it all together? So number one is um, a cell has a fitness, but it's like a factory. A factory has many different workstations. Each workstation is making, one is making widget A, one is making widget B. Each workstation has to be good at what it does. So I have a fitness function for widget A. I have a fitness function for widget B and for widget C. So a cell's fitness is made up of a whole bunch of subcomponent fitnesses from these different black boxes of these five or six types and many, many more that I mentioned. Now, what are the knobs? Well, uh, here, here's a, we get into a little philosophy about G to P versus how to do modeling uh, that's not based on starting from the gene. I don't want to start from the gene. I don't want to start from knowing the protein. I don't want to start from knowing an amino acid sequence. I don't want to start from um, sequence databases. I don't want to do GWAS here because the trouble is the gene sequence is too microscopic a level to, to work to build a model from. Um, it's like in a factory, somebody gives me the parts list for one of the big machines, but I don't really care about the parts list. I care about what is the knob that the guy turns who's running that machine. That's the thing that's going to tell me about the function of that particular workstation. Um, third point is um, we need environment in these kinds of models. Uh, it's really GE to P, not G to P. Uh, the environment is a very strong driver of behaviors, even for a fixed genome. And the last point is the variational principle that's involved here is not stuff rolling downhill. It's about, um, or not about static things rolling downhill. It's about being out of equilibrium and getting these persistent flow balances. And these are the folks that did all the work. And thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Ken, for this fascinating and inspiring, really, uh, novel ways of application of physics again to biology so this is this was really really interesting uh, we can now actually move to the questions and answers uh, let me actually get started i i have uh, two questions one uh, is i mean oftentimes when we go to cell scale or beyond that so we feel that we are limited by experimental data for example we don't have the information about how many proteins we have in the cell, where they are, what is their concentration, and so on and so forth. Have you felt the same in this domain, or you think actually there is a still a lot of experimental data out there for us to look at using your similar model to yours? Um, no, I would agree with you for the most part that there are many, many uh, sort of black box questions and problems right. and fitnesses that we would love to know about that nobody's got any data for. And so the, the cases that we tend to focus on are ones where when we're starting to think about a puzzle and a question, what we really have to ask first is, you know, would there be anything that's worth trying to predict out there? And, and it's, as you say, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the second question, I think that everybody was really interested in the warm story. I guess everybody is mm -hmm. trying to turn down the temperature of the house. <laughs> but actually, do they, do they adjust the temperature of their body like us? Or they don't have any mechanism. No, question. no, they don't. Okay, right. I see. Yeah, I yeah, see. yeah, yeah. So that's it. That's it. Okay, yeah. Shashank, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I have a question regarding this. Uh, the last part of your talk, which was on aging, uh, and there you mentioned about this cell lifespan. I mean, you showed up a lot about cell lifespan and how it varies with temperature. So I'm curious, like, uh, can we say that uh, cells adapt faster when they are heated? Because uh, because mostly the proteins are getting destabilized. Uh, um, so that you raise a really interesting question. So first of all, uh, worm is not the right place for me to and try to address that question because I don't know for one thing. But I can go to E. coli, um, and here's the, this is not a a result. It's a prediction, a prediction of a model. 
that I didn't tell you about that has to do with the temperature dependence. It's the temperature dependence of the growth rate. And we do know what that look curve looks like in great detail for E. coli. So it's a, there's a lot of experimental data for mesophiles, that is for cells that live at normal temperature. We have a lot of data for thermophiles, that is cells that are living at really hot, in hot environments. We know what those curves look like. They have the same shape, but they all get shifted a bit and so forth. We know a lot about that. We can model it, we have modeled it. And here's an interesting prediction for which there's no experimental data as far as I'm aware right now. And that is, let's imagine that I took E. coli that I raise at body, that you know, is, is adjusted to body temperature. And I now want to take it slowly to the point where it evolves so that it can live at 70 degrees instead of say 37 degrees, okay? I wanna evolve it up to a hot, to, uh, to, to live in a hot climate. I can't go very fast by the way, because otherwise I'd kill it right off the bat. But if you take it slowly enough that you can get mutations and more mutations and more mutations and so on. All right, so I'm gonna take E. coli and let it live in the hot, a hot environment. Now I'm also gonna take something that already is adapted to a hot environment. It's already living at 70 degrees. And now what I'm gonna do is just the reverse. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it mutate and mutate and mutate and come back and adapt to lower temperature. Question is, is there symmetry here? And if not, which could happen faster? And it turns out it's, it's quite remarkable it's about, it can happen three orders of magnitude faster that you can adjust to hotter temperatures. And that's great news with global warming, right? So if we were getting global cooling, um, we're screwed. But global warming, maybe we'll get there. Interesting. Zan, did you have a question, Zan? Yeah, of course. Oh, Ken, that was a beautiful hi, talk. Hi, hi. And you know, uh, one of the interesting things, of course, E. coli is a model system, so I understand why you looked at it. But, you know, I'm, as you know from the Gordon conference, I work on the minimal cell. It does not have oxidative phosphorylation, but yeah. we sort of worked out the ATP balance. How are things balanced in that cell? And uh, so I will definitely call and talk to you because they really helped with how to formulate this. And, and like principles that physicists and, and uh, physical chemists uh, would appreciate. But one thing I did want to ask you, you know, uh, in, in doing this and in your homeostasis, one concentrates more on the proteins, but I think it is equally important to look at the pools that have to be in these cells for other metabolites, not only ATP, but also uh, some of the amino acids because many organisms, they've lost the ability to make the amino acids. So uh, right. transport Absolutely. becomes, and then that, I think that connects very nicely to your environment uh, uh, observation. So you have to have many transports to sort of make up this balance. But I think what you've done with the, uh, explaining homostasis can actually be expanded uh, to look also on the metabolite uh, level. Yeah, in principle, absolutely, we've not done it. But um, what we did was we assumed we really wanted to think about cells that were fat and happy. You know, we wanted them to be well fed with everything else, amino acids, they got everything they need um, so that we could just focus on the one thing, which is we're gonna provide glucose, but we're gonna allow them sort of to pull out all the stops in every other conceivable way. In principle though, um, there's a whole realm of modeling that remains to be done and that in that world. And I agree with you, it would be super interesting to do it, especially where there's data. Oh yeah, we have lots of data and really cool. this minimal cell lives at the edge of life, just, <laughs> just, so to say. So thank you so much. As usual, uh, usual, you have these fantastic insight in how to formulate the problem. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Absolutely. Jolie? Uh, hi, so uh, you mentioned that chaperones basically through the aging, they start to fix the unfixable. So that's starts uh, the whole problem. I was thinking, could the problem then be to, so then the chaperones start to evolve in such a way that they become less sensitive to the badly damaged proteins. And you know, if there would be some sort of evolutionary parameter in your model that we can Tone it down and see what would be the outcome. No, that's a cool idea. You know, you could probably do something by directed evolution because mm -hmm. cells don't on their own have not tended to evolve that way. Um, right. And 
you know, the evolutionists would argue that there's good reason. What you all you care about is you want the cell to live until the point where it makes babies. And then after that, I don't care about it anymore if I'm evolution. I just, it's a carcass as far yeah. as I'm concerned. And so um, cells don't on their own necessarily try to do that. Mm -hmm. But you could, in principle, build in some driving forces in a directed evolution experiment. But one other thing that's really interesting, though, it's, it's complicated. And, the reason, and so here's what, there was this interesting company started mm -hmm. around in the mid-1990s. And they made this molecule called something like 17-AAG. And what it was is it was a chaperone inhibitor. And the basic idea is, imagine the following. So if you look at cancer cells, um, cancer cells happen to produce just a, a ton of crappy proteins. And so what is, so the cancer cell has a response to that. What is it? Well, mm -hmm. it is to upregulate its chaperones. It's trying to, it's trying to see, okay, gee, I, I'm seeing a lot of bad proteins. Let me try to fix all this stuff. And mm -hmm. of course the trouble is it's kind of overwhelming it. But so the idea though was let's make this drug that uh, downregulates chaperones and maybe when it hits the cancer cells, it's gonna be downregulating them and they're not gonna be able to fix the proteins and we'll kill the cancer cells faster than we kill the normal cells. And it turned out it worked in um, a couple of cancers. I don't remember which ones, but it had huge side effects. And th this is the trouble. You don't wanna fool with chaperones because they sort of, they're kind of central to everything that's going on. And so the bottom line is there's been a bit of a mixed bag in principle actually in um, worm, also, it turns out you, if you upregulate the chaperones, you can actually increase the lifespan. And mm -hmm. I think that's pretty cool, but you can only increase it so much. And in other organisms, trouble is, you know, in like E. coli, there's four chaperone systems. In humans, there's like around a hundred or something. Yeah. So the trouble is you have to be very careful what you work with because you then you, you have all these sort of competing effects. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so there are lots of questions. I, I, I'm going to take two more. Shri Vidya. Um, hi, Ken. This is Shri Ayer Biswas from Purdue. Hi, um, Shri. How are you? Uh, excellent. Thank you. And thank you for a terrific talk. Um, as usual, lots of food for thought. Um, I will use this opportunity to quickly ask three questions in one. <laughs> um, <laughs> one, uh, do you have any comments on how the aging work might give us ideas on how to rejuvenate the worm, like what point of intervention uh, might be uh, helpful, what is too much damage to recover? And the related question is, is there something uh, qualitatively different about the breakdown of homeostasis for death versus aging? And if uh, Arnad will not get too mad at me, my third and last question, which is unrelated is, um, would you comment on the surface area to volume ratio in the other scenarios that you didn't talk about? For example, is it related to the ribosome fraction of the cell? Okay, third one first. No, we haven't. Uh, that one's simple. Unfortunately, we haven't. So it, um, in principle, we could put various of these little modules together and, and think about them. Uh, what, what we're trying to do first is just, you know, can we, can we sort of strip out stuff that seems irrelevant and stick with the smallest black box we can work with at a time? So answer to the third one is no. Uh, first one is um, you asked, is there, are there ways to intervene? So, so far, if I'm, uh, if I'm understanding your question, so far, uh, the intervention that we were able to put into the model is the upregulating or downregulating of chaperones <clears throat> and uh, as I say, that one, the answer is yes, it works, but only to a limited extent. I can upregulate the chaperones a little bit, and then you start bumping into other things. And some of the other things that you bump into are not things that we have in our model. Like right now, for example, it turns out that worms have this other feature that I think is actually representative of us human beings too, which is that with age, it's not just your proteome that's getting kind of screwed up and, and working at, at less effectively and so on. Uh, it's also your energy balance system and your, mito your mm -hmm. mitochondria and so on. You're producing much less energy. So old worms actually have something like only a tenth of the amount of ATP as young worms have. 
So Let's you're see. really running with a with a very on very low power, trying to be able to keep the whole system functioning. Anyway, long story short, the the only intervention that we looked at so far was really just the upregulating or downregulating of uh, chaperones. Was was that your first question? I hope I got that right. Yes. Um, thank you so much, and look forward to keeping the conversation going offline. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Last question, Matt. Yeah, um, thank you uh, for the talk. Uh, I just had a quick question concerning the fermentation story. Um, so do you think the sort of decision, so to speak, to move away from oxidative phosphorylation might also be somewhat influenced by the fact that the fermentation proteins are less complex. Um, they're smaller, probably easier to fold than the electron transport chain proteins. Do you think that might also be some added pressure to switch to ferment fermentation? Yeah, it's possible. It's a good question. I don't know. We didn't, we haven't modeled that. We haven't attempted it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, there's, you know, sort of everything talks to everything in a cell. And so it's possible that that's true. Um, but I guess I, what I would say is the only one bit of data that we were really going after here was this puzzle about the divergence that happens mm -hmm. right when you get to a three hour duplication time. That's the speed limit where all of a sudden, now if you start from low speeds and you go up to higher speeds, it's three per hour, or sorry, uh, three hours per replication. Three hours per replication is the magical switchover place where all of a sudden fermentation starts to kick in. And the bottom line at the moment is this simple model was sufficient to capture that and it was also sufficient to capture this uh, NAD plus toxicity issue. Um, and, uh, but I have no doubt you're probably right. There's a lot of other things going on too, but that's where we are at the moment. Right, okay, right. thank you. All right, so I'm gonna, on behalf of everyone, thank you again, Ken, for the very stimulating, fascinating talk that's inspired many, many people actually, especially younger students in the field. Hopefully they, they'll follow <laughs> on your uh, path and then make, interesting observations about biology. Hopefully we can learn this more actually in depth. Thank you very much. So thank you all. Gonna... Thank you Go. all very much. I've enjoyed it enormously. <laughs>